Okay, so now this leads me on to even more innovations and inventions in industry. Basically, the textile business in England was originally a cottage industry. This meant that you know, it was mainly done in small workshops, basically people's homes, only with a few employees. Uh, raw cotton was, was first combed to produce long pieces of yarn. The yarn was then spun into thread on a spinning wheel, then the threads were woven onto a loom to make a fabric. Arkwright, Richard Arkwright's invention meant that a machine could replace a person in creating fabrics. In 1760, he invented the machine known as the spinning frame, a device that could spin 128 threads at the same time. In the 1770s, he improved upon the already existing carding machine that this device, in, oh, sorry, this device com combed cotton fibre into thread. But he had to find a way to combine the spinning frame and the carving machine under one roof. Arkwright joined then with two other men in the textile business, Jedediah Strutt and Samuel Mead. In 1771, these three men built the world's, world's first water-powered cotton mill at Cromford. The mill employed about 200 people, mainly women and children, and the success of this mill meant that eventually he began to set up these water-powered mills as far away as Scotland. By the mid-1780s, steam power began to take over, and production required more coal than water. This meant that the factories no longer had to be set up by waterways, which meant they could obviously be anything like a whole range of places around Britain. And this brings us on to Britain's economy during the 1760s to the 1800s. So as we can see, it is estimated that the economy grew at a very slow rate at the beginning of the 18th century at 0.7%, rising to 1.3% in the 1780s. This, went, this rose to over 3% <coughs> in the 1830s. Although there was no national plan for the construction of canals, they were extremely important to continued economic growth. The rate of economic growth by the late 18th century was enough to sustain the industrialization of Britain. The, the impact of industrial change in Britain started to show in the mid to late 1700s. Population growth increased demand for various industrial and agricultural products. This also meant that there was a larger pool of workers which could be utilized in the production of these goods. As we've seen earlier, these, there were significant developments and new technologies in the textile industry which moved from water power to steam power, well, from people power to water power to steam power. Thomas Newcomen's, Newcomen's steam piston engine also increased efficiency in coal mining. This led to a huge reserve, which meant less chance of fuel shortages. And the factories employing these new technologies were allowed to work all year round at near maximum efficiency. This only drove Britain's economy even further. Workers also began to see more material wealth for their labour and thus became more productive and wanted to achieve more and more. The entrepreneurship and business acumen of inventors such as Richard Arkwright meant that they were always looking to improve and help sustain this growing economy. During this time, Britain's prosperity grew an incredible amount. Products were being mass produced by machines on an increasingly larger scale, as opposed to being made by hand. This meant that the need for canals and railways increased. They were primarily designed to improve access to coal, because transportation meant coal could be sold cheaper, which was also a huge boon to the industry. The rapid incline of the coal industry meant that the need for railways was increasing. At the beginning of the 1800s, railways improved transportation even further. In 1830, the rail line between Manchester and Liverpool was the first passenger line created. And by 1850, there were over 6,000 miles of rail track laid in Britain. And this brings me on to what the Industrial Revolution actually was and what it meant. So, in the 18th century, British industries were mostly small scale and not very sophisticated. The Industrial Revolution was a turning point as new inventions drove industry to become more efficient. S machines such as the steam driven piston engine, as I mentioned before, used primarily for deep mining, began to aid industry in a way that was unforeseeable to most. Early 18th century British industries were generally small scale. For example, most textile production was centred on small workshops or even homes of spinners, as I mentioned before. This small scale, small scale production was prevalent across all of Britain, with different regions specialising in different products. Oops, myself, where are we? Um, like, for example, metal production in the Midlands and coal mining in the North East. Industrialisation describes the change in a country's economy as it changes from one based on agriculture to one based on mass production. It brings with it more complex and advanced technology which is used to aid the process of producing goods such as coal and iron. Now we can have a look at what caused the industri what caused industrialization in Great Britain. As the 18th century progressed, many people in rural society were being pushed out of rural areas and pulled towards urban centres. Furthermore, as the 18th century progressed, as I just said, I don't know why that's said twice, uh, the population of Britain began to significantly increase. The change from an agricultural to an industry to an industrial economy had a profound effect on every part of life in Britain. In 1750, <coughs> approximately 15% of the people of the population lived in towns, increasing to about 25% in 1800, and by 1880, increasing to 80%. As a result, a dramatic increase, as a result of a dramatic increase in urbanization, towns and cities have become overpopulated. And this brings me on to enclosure acts. Um, originally, enclosures of land took place through in, informal agreements. 
for during the 17th century, the practice of, taming, of obtaining authorization by an act of parliament developed. Initiatives to enclose land came either from landowners hoping to maximize rental from their estates or from tenant farmers anxious to improve their farms. From the 1750s, the enclosure of land by the Parliamentary Act became the norm. Overall, between 1604 and 1914, over 5,200 enclosure bills were enacted by Parliament, which related to just over a fifth of the total area of England, amounting to some 6.8 million acres. Now we're going to have a look at the impact of industrial change on British social, economic and political life by 1850. <coughs> Excuse me. With the factory system booming, there are now large numbers of labouring people working together with common social attitudes as well as common economic positions. This spawned what is now known as the working class. These people who are concentrated in urban areas essentially spawned what is now known as a working class consciousness. This is opposed to a previously mainly rural population where there was no significant concentration of labouring people. As the working class exists, so too does the middle class. These people were wealthier than the working class and had common interests in politics, economics and social attitudes. Before the 1780s and the Industrial Revolution, most historians consider working people as those whose job required manual labour, and the people who had reasonable, reasonable wealth were coined as the middle class. It is recognised by many that the Industrial Revolution is what gave rise to class consciousness. So now this brings me on to what class consciousness actually is. A nice picture of that right there. Um, so class consciousness, what is it? <coughs> It is political theory that refers to the beliefs of a person holds in accordance with their social class, relationship to the economy and their interests as a class. Notable social theorist Karl Marx believed that the middle and upper class's role in society was to keep the labouring working class blind to their exploitation. The relationship between the upper and working class can be, can be described as exploitative, exploitative because the amount of money the employer pays the worker is less than the total value to the good produced. Marx theorised that profit is essentially the accumulated exploitation of workers in a capitalist society. <coughs> Marx believed that the bourgeoisie, the upper middle class, used their control of major institutions to keep the working class ignorant of their exploitation. And industrialization and the vast numbers of laborers moving to urban areas looking for work meant that there was a huge concentration of laborers in cities and towns. These people would have a lot in common in terms of employment, wealth, and social standing, and eventually would work together for common reasons. Before the end of the 18th century, most industrialists and entrepreneurs tended to live in or near town centers, near to their business and the economic base of the town. The urban population grew to extreme levels when the working class labourers started to move in and look for work. This drove the middle class of businessmen, businessmen and industrialists to move just outside the city centre to what is known now as the suburb. So, was industrialisation a good thing? Who knows? So far, it seems that industrialisation was a beneficial change. It had boosted the economy, transport networks, te technological advancements and food supplies. However, it also produced a negative response. These include industrial rioting and protest, urban poverty and insanitary working and living conditions associated with urbanisation. There was a short life expectancy for these workers, women, children and men, who were working and living in these insanitary conditions. They were prone to workplace injuries due to the machinery they were working with. These machines weren't built with safety in mind, rather with efficiency. The government had to adapt their policies to improve these conditions. And they did that by introducing a certain number of acts. The first we're going to take a look at is the Factory Act of 1833. So, Basically, the two main points were it is now legal to employ children who have not turned 10 years old. It decreased the number of hours worked by a child under the age of 11. And as the Industrial Revolution gathered pace, thousands of factories sprang up all over the country. Initially, there were no laws relating to the running of factories, as there had been no need for them before. As a result, dangerous, mach dangerous machinery was used that could and frequently did cause serious injuries to workers. People were also made to work incredibly long hours, often through the night. Perhaps the worst feature of this new industrial age was the use of child labour, which is just so alien to us now. Very young children worked long hours and could face severe punishments for any mistakes they made. By 1833, the government passed what was to be the first of many acts which dealt with working conditions and hours. To begin with, there was limited power to enforce these acts, but as the century progressed, the, the rules were enforced more strictly. These are a few of the changes that the government had made to protect the people working in these factories. I've already told you two of them. So now we've got um, employers were requ required to have an age certificate for their child workers. Children of 9 to 13 year olds were not allowed to work more than 9 hours a day. 13 to 8 year old, 18 year olds were limited to 12 hours a day. Children were not permitted to work at night and they must receive 2 hours of schooling each day. And there were to be 4 factory inspectors who were, imported, who were appointed to enforce these laws. Another act that was introduced by the government was the Combination Act of 1799 to 1800. Just a few people protesting there. Um, 
In 1799 and 1780, William Pitt, the Prime Minister, decided to take action against political agitation among industrial workers. The Combination Act was passed by Parliament, which made it illegal for workers to join together as a union. Industrial workers wanted to put pressure on their employers by demanding shorter hours and better pay. The Combination Act essentially made it illegal for unions to be formed. This aided the middle class businessmen by blocking any glimpse of workers joining together and going on mass strikes in the hope that they would receive better pay for their labour. It was repealed in 1824, and this was followed by an outbreak of strikes, and as a result of this, the Act was then again passed in 1825. And even <coughs> another Act that was passed was the Poor Law in 1834. In 1834, a new law, Poor Law, was introduced. This law sought to benefit the deserving poor and set out to sanction the undeserving poor. Richard Onslow was among some of the high-profile middle-class men who opposed this poor law and campaigned for it to be reformed. The deserving poor were those who had been widowed or orphaned. It also include, it includes infirms. The undeserving poor who were those who had been unemployed by choice. It also ensured that the poor were housed in workhouses and that they were clothed and fed. Children who were sent to work in workhouses <coughs> also received some education, I say some, in return for this, the paupers would have to work several hours each day. The poor law was set up to reward those who worked hardest by increasing their wages. It encouraged an awareness of poverty. Not all Victorians shared this point of view. Richard Osler, which can be described <coughs> as a radical Tory, opposed this new law. He coined the term for these workhouses as prisons for the poor. The poor themselves hated and feared the threat of the workhouses so much that there were many riots in northern towns. Now, some of the political responses to industrialisation include Luddism and Chartism. Luddites were self-employed textile workers who, with this new technology of spinning frames, power looms and stocking frames, feared the end of their trade. They, protest they protested against these newly developed technologies that were created to save on hiring workers. There were a number of Luddite rebellions, mostly in northwestern England, where most of the textile industry took place. <coughs> and Chartism was a working class movement in between 1838 and 1858 that was seeking changes to the political system in Britain. <coughs> It was particularly strong in Northern England, East Midlands, the Black Country, and in the valleys of South Wales. They used petitions and mass meetings to put pressure on politicians to make them re recognize male suffrage, which means a lot to vote. They were hoping to secure greater democracy. They wanted a vote for every man of 21 years old, a sound mind, and not undergoing punishment for any crime. This brings me on to summary. <coughs> So here we have, the Industrial Revolution began in the 18th century when rural agricultural Britain became more industrialised and urban. It transformed the economy from a primarily agricultural one to one focused on mass production of goods. The Industrial Revolution in Britain increased the overall amount of wealth and distributed it more widely. Um, with the new technologies that were being utilised in factories, it brought new dangers to the lives and well-being of its workers. There were also new technologies used in animal husbandry and the planting and harvesting of crops. So to summarise. <coughs> The Industrial Revolution first began in Britain around 1760. Before this period, British industries were generally small scale and relatively unsophisticated. For example, textile production in a confined to small workshops or even in the homes of the workers. New techniques and technologies in agriculture paved the way for change. More and more food was being produced over the century, ensuring that enough was available to meet the needs of an ever-growing population. A surplus of cheap agricultural labour led to severe unemployment and rising poverty in rural areas. Many people left the countryside to find works in towns and cities. This set the scene for a large-scale, labour-intensive factory system. Initially, there were limited sources of power, but technologies invented by people such as Thomas Newcomen and Richard Arkwright made sure that there was enough fuel to burn the fires of industry. The Turnpike Act saw to it that there were adequately moderated roads, railways and canals which were used to transport coal, pig iron, timber and many other goods. These were needed all over the country. By 1815, over 2,000 miles of canals were in use in Britain. The industrialisation, industrial revolution, brought with it greater wealth for the people of Britain, but also brought extensive po problems, mainly to do with workers' rights. <coughs> the labouring source could be described as being exploited by those who owned and operated the factories. Women, men and children were all made to work long hours in extremely dangerous conditions. The Factory Act of 1833 sought to help children in making sure they were getting educated as well as giving them basic worker right, workers' rights. The working class wanted to revolt against this exploitation and they wanted to form unions to appeal for higher wages and fewer hours. Obviously this was no longer a possibility when the government passed the Combination Act, which made unionising illegal. The Industrial Revolution is in Britain is seen by many as the reason behind the class system that we still have today. The working class's labour is being exploited by the upper class who are in control of the major institutions in Britain, although it's not as prevalent. And that's everything. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay.